Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Hello everyone and welcome to Toolkit Tuesday. I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. I hope wherever you are in the world, you're keeping safe and well and we appreciate you taking time out of your day, evening, night, whatever it may be to join us today. This is episode one of season three of Toolkit Tuesday. We started Toolkit Tuesday as an experiment to gauge the level of interest and we've been delighted by the response and the requests for more episodes. So we made it through the dreaded uh, first season to season two and then... Um, here we are in season three, so we must be doing something right. And uh, today we are going to focus on a body of knowledge called Open Fair, which is made up of two standards of the Open Group, uh, ORA, which is Open Risk Analysis, and ORT, which is Open Risk Taxonomy. And uh, we'll dive into the detail of that with uh, two experts in a short while. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the way we do questions on the WebEx tool is through the Q&A channel. So if you can't see a Q&A channel, please uh, click on the three dots in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and you'll see uh, an option to click on Q&A and please submit your questions to the speakers through that Q&A channel rather than the chat channel. However, we do encourage you to make use of the chat channel to say hello to other attendees at the uh, at the event and also to um, tell us in particular, tell us where you're joining us from. We're very proud of the global nature of the Open Group and we usually get uh, a lot of different countries represented on these uh, broadcasts. So please let us know where you, where you are and uh, give us any comments. We've had some great feedback on the uh, on the shows so far. So without further ado, we are going to move to our main topic today, which I said was open fair and particularly using open fair for cyber risk quantification. And we have a double act today. Our two speakers are colleagues, both uh, at Ostrich Cyber Risk. The uh, first is Jack Witsit, who is director of risk qualification. And Jack is a leader in the cyber risk qualification community with more than two decades of information security experience. He spent the past six years advancing the state of the art by expanding and refining existing CRQ, including FAIR, into targeted best practices. In his role as Director of Risk Quantification at Aust Ostrich Cyber Risk, Jack helps inform product direction and leads the new Ostrich Cyber Risk Professional Services Division, tasked with getting customers off the ground with risk quantification while avoiding or mitigating common pitfalls. And joining Jack, his colleague Yanis Vasiliadis, who is Chief Product Officer at Ostrich Cyber Risk. In that role, Yanis brings his product and company expansion expertise to lead the product and go-to-market strategies, manage analyst relations and direct engineering and product marketing. Together with the executive and engineering leadership team, he works to advance Ostrich Cyber Risk's position as a leader in the cyber risk management and cyber risk quantification spaces. And uh, please submit as a reminder your questions to uh, the Q&A channel and my colleague John Linford, who is the forum director for the Security Forum and the Open Trusted Technology Forum here at the Open Group, will be handling the Q&A today. So without further ado, over to our guest speakers, Jack Witsit and Yanis Vasiliadis. Welcome, gentlemen. Thrilled to, to be here. 
So the reason at Ostrich Cyber Risk we based our CRQ solution on the open fair model is because it gives you control and flexibility to build risk scenarios as complex as you need to. You choose the level of depth of the analysis that you want to do and the data that you have available to you. We all look at CRQ to report on the financial impact of risk. Give me that ALE. And of course, we want to use the annual loss expectancy to help us make informed decisions, aid prioritization, justify budget, communicate to the business people. Option A will reduce risk by $1 million over the next 12 months, and it will cost us $250,000 to implement. However, option B will reduce risk by $800,000 over the next 12 months, but will only cost us $100,000 to implement. Deriving such results uh, with a certain level of confidence can be great, uh, but we often run into uh, run scenarios without spending enough diligence in the preparation, like defining risk, a risk appetite, and overall good scenario scoping. So we do run into a few roadblocks. Scrutiny due to lack of trust in the numbers. Well, how did you come up with these numbers is the first thing the CFO will ask. After all, if a particular risk has a probability to incur losses once in 10 years, well, that's a long time to wait to prove out the model. We don't know where or how to get data to power the model, or we don't have consensus and more. So Jack is going to walk us through why CRQ context management is imperative to successful CRQ programs. And we hope that you will leave the session with the understanding that the CRQ journey is as important as the destination. And with that, Jack, take it away. Jonas, I appreciate it. And thanks everybody for being here. So before we talk about CRQ, let's talk about um, where, where we might want to apply CRQ and, and, and why. Um, because it's, it's maybe a little bit broader, maybe a little bit more nuanced than uh, folks new to CRQ um, might consider. So the first question is like, why are we, why are we running this? And, and there's a few objectives that you might have from CRQ. And, you know, one, because you want to improve the quality of, and, and the likelihood that you have good decision outcomes. But also there are some underlying things like, are, are, are we confident in these decisions? How sure are we? Can, can we increase the amount of certainty that we have in understanding our risk? If we have better certainty that we can make, you know, uh, maybe we can put our resources somewhere else. Whereas if we don't have confidence, maybe there's additional amount of work we need to do and so on. You know, we want to increase objectivity. Uh, we want to increase tangibility to people by using dollars and cents and things like this. Sometimes we want to better communicate the risk to others or achieve consensus on what the risk drivers are and that sort of thing. Um, transparency um, by going through good process, um, you know, we, we, we are able to get more buy-in on the decisions we make and comparability over time, things like that. The other thing I want to talk about briefly is that, you know, our risk decisions where we apply, quote, risk may show up in actual decisions that have the word risk in them. How much risk do we have? Um, you know, why do I have risk? What can I do to have risk? But what's interesting is our organizations make risk decisions all of the time, and not all of them you can directly apply CRQ to as a process. And so what, what becomes interesting is we use the same process for a number of decisions all throughout the organization. And so, and it can help to create some standardization and systemization around how we make those decisions. If you see urgency or order or importance or efficacy or security or worry or need or those sorts of things, that is somebody making trying to make a risk decision. And so you want to go through a reasonably good process um, for each of those decisions. Otherwise, you end up with misalignment or a lack of objectivity or a lack of certainty and those sorts of things. And so when we talk about CRQ, it's not just part of some standalone process. It's not just about the reports, but it's about how do we make better decisions in the organization as a whole, um, large and small, formal and informal. So, um, you know, when we talk about CRQ, what is it? Um, you know, we're measuring risk. Um, it's not just about coming up with numbers, but it's about process. It's about the models and the assumptions that we're making. It's about the application of data, which can be knowledge and experience, not just logs or telemetry. It's about using math to combine that information in a way that makes it easier to understand or, or that otherwise helps improve sort of the fidelity we have off of the information. And the point here is that we're not, um, trying to forecast the predict the future. We're not trying to get down to five nines of certainty. What we're trying to do is use 
a model like with frequency and magnitude and those things along with process and along with data and along with math to make better decisions. And what becomes, you know, interesting with this is that that same process and some of those same models and some of the same data can be used super informally or very formally. And there are things you have to do. There are questions that you have to answer whether or not you ever go through a formal CRQ process at the end. And so while on screen here, you see, you know, open fair, loss of end frequency, loss magnitude, this is the end state. Like after all of your sort of assessment processes are done, they should be able to answer questions about how often are we expecting loss? Um, how, how much should that loss be and why? But at the end of the day, these are questions, again, that you're gonna have to answer to make a good decision, whether or not you put it into a tool and whether or not you assign numbers to it. So let's talk a little bit about what that process should look like for CRQ in particular, and then we're gonna expand it a little bit. So first, it really is just more than numbers. So the first step in a good assessment pro risk assessment process is identifying, you know, what is the concern? Let's scope the questions that we're asking. You know, what what topics are 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 we uncertain about? Um, how specific do our results need to be? Um, you know, what on what criteria are we making a decision based on? Is there some sort of risk appetite? Is there some sort of cost? Uh, some sort of time constraints? And so, if you don't sort of answer this question up front, and you don't answer it for all the stakeholders involved, then your assessment process, whether it's CRQ or not, is potentially going to be misaligned. And so this is a formal part of, you know, cyber risk quantification. Same with scenario scoping, you know, at a high level, what are the triggers that you're worried about? What are the loss events? You know, um, what are the, you know, how specific do you need to be in order to make the decision about these things? So what we're really talking about, about what is the concern is just decomposing um, your, 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 your threats and, and your objectives. This isn't really even turning them into scenarios yet. That's really when we get to step two, when it's going, okay, why are these concerns? You know, we, we might be worried about a threat event, like maybe um, some sort of threat communities are financially motivated and they're interested in, you know, um, extortion, maybe through ransomware. So, you know, that might be the threat event that we've identified in step one, but step two, it's, is this even plausible? Could this occur here? What kind of tactics might they use? What are the vulnerable surfaces that, that they might exploit? What kinds of surfaces? And if we have one that we think is pertinent, do we have others? You know, would removing it actually change our risk posture at all? These are discussions that we should be having when we're assessing and analyzing risk. Again, whether or not we're doing CRQ, but in order to do, do CRQ, we should be doing them as well. So, you know, what are the control objectives? If we understand what the bad guys might try and sort of what kind of surfaces they might rely on, this starts to indicate what our controls should be doing. If we have a set of like 10 threat scenarios that might cause, you know, a number of different loss scenarios, then that collection sort of is, defines what our controls should be doing to manage risk for us. Um, and, you know, what kind of, um, are those controls even available? Interestingly, you know, we, we talk about min, max, and most likely in CRQ, and that, is important to talk about um, from a you know control basis. Are we? It's our concern that our best case um, in in terms of our control performance is a problem. Are we concerned that our worst case? Are we concerned that our reliability over time of our controls are a problem, or the duration of our our vulnerabilities versus the frequency of the vulnerabilities? So you know, as we go through and look, you know, are we? Again, are, is this going to be a problem because it's, we think it's going to happen a lot? Or do we think it's a problem because we think there's maybe an existential impact? And very often these things get conflated in our discussion and our assessment processes. Somebody comes to the table, table and they've heard about data breaches left and right. Um, and they've also heard about these terrible data breach costs. But it, it, you know, they, it turns out that if they really break it down, um, a lot of those data breaches are very small from a frequency basis, but um, the big ones are infrequent. And so sort of really breaking down the cause and effect and how that aligns our objectives is an important part of this process. Third, this is where we start getting into, in, in CRQ, where we start getting into numbers traditionally, but this is more than just numbers. This is start asking from a benchmark basis. Okay, we understand what we're worried about. We understand why we're worried about. Now, how do we assess how, how bad it is? The first thing we do is should, should do is look around us. You know, is, is this happening to our peers? Have we had anything happen like this before? What are near misses that might have occurred? Again, these conversations are useful to help build um, quantitative uh, analysis work, 
but on you know on the other hand um they're, they're also good for just qualitative assessment work um triage once we've got benchmarks we ask ourselves how are we different do we have more of an exposed surface than our peers do we have less um you know what is different what's the same what do you know as subject matter experts what's going to change in the future from what the benchmarks have said in the past and then finally like do we have any evidence to support this we have metrics and data what metrics and what data supports our assumptions in the estimation process fourth is going to be what's the best response this is interesting because even this is crq is great at helping us delineate these types this part of the analysis process but it's not necessarily required. The first question is risk driver analysis. We've assessed everything. Do we think it now that we've gone through the process, let's go back. Do we think it's a frequency and magnitude process problem? Because a frequency problem is controlled differently than a magnitude or an impact problem. Same with min maximus likely we're revisiting that why we've, uh, we've gone through benchmarks, estimates and data, and we're going back. But then the second part of this is also interesting, which is what is our, you know, are, are we concerned that this is, it's not so much that we have an existential problem in any one event, but this is maybe, um, you know, the fact that just over time, our budget isn't enough to handle the variety of events that we're talking about, or the probability of exceeding in a given year. This is potentially your storm model. Man, that's a, we can't handle one of those one, one, one in a hundred year floods or incidents, but we're good with maybe those one in 20 year size incidents. And then finally, you know, at the end of this, this is, do we have confidence in the decision? Do we, have we gone through process? Do we trust the process we went through? How good was our data? We can get through the process with pretty bad data with not a lot of information, and we're gonna make a better decision than before, whether we quantify it or not. But capturing that last bit is um, one of the more interesting parts of the CRQ process, because then it goes, you can target your controls for increasing these visibility. So, with all of that said, I'm going to revisit that exact same conversation in terms of like, how do we build a systematic analysis of how this process is going to go? So, you know, let's look at what the concern is from an action basis. We should be making sure that we understand and normalize internal risk and what our objectives are and what our decisions are. This includes asking questions like, what are our constrained resources? Are we worried about cash going out the door? Are we worried about revenue changes now or, or our forecast revenue changes? Are we worried about market valuation? Those sorts of things. Are we worried about who's, who has an equity and security? Who actually cares and why do they care? And when does that care if it's not being met, start um, changing into loss for our organization? Um, you know, what are our objectives and how might they be impacted by threats at a business level? Are we making any, you know, investments? Are we, are we doing some mergers and acquisitions? Do we have, you know, what are we doing that we won't be able to accomplish if, um, if, if our security isn't met? Because that starts to constrain what we need to do analysis of. The same thing, um, you know, a landscape, what, like, let's look at the BIA work that we've done, the business impact analysis. Let's look at our enterprise risk register. These are outcomes, you know, these are the, the sort of the business context that cybersecurity risk exists in. And then on the other side, what does the outside world look like? Not so much as it applies to us, but what are bad people doing these days? This isn't like going through the MITRE attack framework and going what kind of TTPs they're using, but like, are we worried about, you know, espionage from nation states? Does that even impact us? You know, are we worried about, you know, global conflict? Are, are we worried about um, insiders? And, and what about insiders? What motivations? What kind of things would they even attack? This isn't like our PII stored on database number 12. This is, hey, are they looking for marketable data if they're interested in financial gain and what kind of marketable data? Um, you know, that, that sort of conversation. Um, and as we go through this, um, you know, actions, why is that concern? This is when you, once we understand the, the external considerations, what are visibility objectives? What kind of information do we need to gather in order to assess um, what our risk is? So this is understanding what the moving parts are. This is understanding how we're going to measure different parts of the pro get the get the information in different ways. Like again, are we using BIA? Are we using our GRC system? Or you know, where is this information going to come from? Um, and then if we don't do this, then we have duplication contradictory of assessment work. Um, you know, we might risk miss, miss risk factors. Um, and so as you know, we're, we're looking through not just what is the concern, but why is it a concern? 
this information is collected throughout our organizations already in different forms for the most part. Some of it isn't. And if it isn't, sometimes we don't know because we haven't systematically gone through this process of going, you know, what are TTPs that we care about? What are the key surface areas? What are the key, you know, infrastructure? How are our controls relate? What controls depend on each other? And you can target those conversations and those questions against your concerns up in step number one. And if but you don't do this, then you might be doing 12 different assessments and they might be not be answering the right questions or they might be duplicating the answers or they might be making different assumptions. And so really what you're trying to accomplish here is going, okay, we, there's some variables, there's some uncertainty about what the concerns are, how are we going to measure it? Then we go, okay, well, how do we apply that information is really step three, that let's organize into hypotheses. Like how do our threat events relate to our controls, relate to um, our surfaces, relate to loss events? You know, what indicates, you know, about the data, the assessments that we've done, what are the best indicators? Um, you know, because we, telemetry uh, and, and what do they integrate? For example, vulnerability scanning tells us a couple of different things. One, we have vulnerabilities today, but it doesn't really tell us who's going to be using them, how long those are going to last. The, the, but the telemetry might also tell us how good our controls are operating. Like if, if our vulnerabilities are lasting for three months, then that is interesting if, versus if they're lasting three days. And so, you know, this is really systematizing. This is taking that data and organizing it in a way that's going to tell you a story in particular, that's going to answer a specific sort of question that we've identified. And then, you know, uh, after that, we're looking at what's the best response. This is where we formally go through and do a time and stress analysis. Um, is this, you know, uh, an overtime problem or, or you know, a, a capacity problem? This is when we start asking the business, you know, how much can you take in a given year? What are your budgets? Like, where, where are you going to get stressed? Uh, and, and do we have to make a decision here? This is when we look at control opportunities. This is when you document, hey, it looks like we can reduce the frequency or it looks like we can reduce the magnitude of, of those sorts of things. And then you can start evaluating those control opportunities against sort of a cost benefit analysis for you. Is this worth it? And again, this is all things you can do with three people in a room and make your best effort, or you can turn it into a large, large formal process. There's still steps you're gonna to have to take. The only change is really going to be how much, how explicit you are about it, how well you document it, how well you need to document it, um, you know, et cetera. But it's still the same process, even if it's in one person's head. Um, and if, you know, we don't do like the best response analysis, then obviously we might have solutions that don't manage risk. We might have, um, you know, rework or, or, or you know, et cetera. Lastly, you know, after action, you know, document, communicate the confidence um, so that you can target upgrade or add visibility controls. And then, you know, it, it's one of the more valuable things you can do. For example, if you don't know how susceptible you are to given threat events, this is great feedback to give your red team and it can help target your red team against where, where you need to go. If you don't know, hey, how often do we patch things and how long do vulnerabilities last? And as we went through the analysis process, we couldn't answer that, then that is an assessment task that needs to show up. So that is uh, on a high level, the, uh, this is taking the CRQ process that we talked about over here um, and then systematizing it and going into some high level steps that we can take. Again, whether we take these in an hour or we build this into a, a robust process, that's up to sort of the use cases for you. So with that, um, that is um, a quick introduction to sort of a subjective process for, for risk analysis that also supports CRQ. Um, happy to field any questions for the remainder of the time. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jack. Excellent stuff. Uh, and Giannis, not sure if you're still there and if uh, you'd like to come off mute and turn video on as well for the Q&A portion. Um, so a couple of questions for you guys. So first of all, um, you know, you mentioned and you focused on this aspect of embracing subjectivity, but you still kept it in the realm of quantitative risk analysis, CRQ. What advice would you have for an organization with leadership that is dead set on doing qualitative risk analysis, but, you know, you as the analyst see the value in doing it quantitatively. So I, I think you can write great narratives out of each of the steps. In fact, I'll go back for a second. So if you look at it this way, you can develop products to answer each of the, each of these sets of questions. 
And that is, those are potentially subjective answers, but you as an analyst can then take those answers and convert them to, you know, a quantitative analysis and maybe include that as an augment. So your, 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 your leadership team or whoever is a little bit skeptical, they get the, they get what they expect. They get what, what makes them happy, but also give the, they have an opportunity to look at having that augment and having that support. You know, we all have, you know, many of us have robust pre-existing, you know, uh, process infrastructure and expectations and culture, and we can't supplant it directly, but we can augment it. We can provide, use, add the, add the quantitative bit to the end to provide additional evidence and clarity. One other thing I would add to that, uh, John, is that in the tooling, there is uh, the possibility of a framework to bring together the two sides so that uh, you're working off of one platform and there is a more of a methodology around leveraging the qualitative results within the CRQ scenario uh, structure. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Thank Absolutely. you, guys. One more question for you. Um, you know, the process that you mentioned involves consulting with subject matter experts, getting those data, getting those input, but stuff changes, things change. How often do you have to go pester those people and get new estimates? That's a really, really good question. So one of the great things about systematizing this, um, particularly in this order, is that you, you want to, it helps you also reuse the material. So if you have a sort of a, a static understanding of, of high level threats, because the motives for your, for your bad things aren't going to change very often, you're, you're not going to suddenly be worried about a completely different set of threat actors at a high level who have entirely different motives, right? Like we've got financial gain or espionage or, you know, whatever that is. And so by creating that structure ahead of time, and that, that understanding what our loss events are ahead of time, that gives you a foundation for asking things once and just updating them periodically. So that's part of it is put that big picture in place so that you're not, every time somebody asks you a different question, you're not going to have to regather data. But then the second part of that is if you look, some of this just doesn't change very often. Like the, the again, the high level threats, the high level decision criteria, the why why it's concern why is that a concern might change a little bit frequent more frequently right but think in terms of how long it takes to respond um if you can't respond if, if you're capturing information every hour but it takes three months to respond to that information then there's no sense in in recapturing it every 12 minutes right you, so you know i would look at once a year reevaluating maybe what your concerns are and then starting with why it's a concern maybe once a year because you have projects that are going to happen etc then how much a concern maybe you update quarterly and then best response think of best response as you you're asking the system or your process different questions and so you can ask those questions as often as you need to just update the data and the inputs only frequently as frequently as you can take advantage of them if that makes sense Definitely. Excellent answer. And unfortunately, that is all the time we have for Q&A. But thank you very much again, Jack and Giannis, for joining us for today's Toolkit Tuesday. Uh, thank you all of our attendees for joining us as well. Um, and back to, I believe, Steve Nunn for our outro. So again, thank you all. Great stuff. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, John, for handling the Q&A there. And thank you to Jack and Yanis for coming here today and sharing your perspectives. Um, very interesting. And uh, thank you again for, for joining us today. And thank you to everyone of you who attended today, either live or watching this in the comfort and convenience of your own time zone. Um, it was great having you with us on Toolkit Tuesday. The next one, please join us next week for the next few weeks uh, leading up to the Open Group uh, Summit in April. We are running Toolkit Tuesday every week rather than every two weeks. So uh, next week, March 14th, our episode will um, focus on the portfolio of digital open standards and how that's useful for architects, how it can increase the convenience and quality of architecture work. So that uh, digital um, portfolio is something you may have heard us talk about. It's bringing together various open group standards so that they're cross-referenceable and cross-searchable making them kind of easier to use together basically and to talk us through that we have 
one of our panel of experts here at Toolkit Tuesday, Chris Frost from Fujitsu. So it's a great one to uh, join us for. Please join us March 14th. Meanwhile, keep safe and well and uh, have a great week. I'm Steve Nunn. Thank you for watching Toolkit Tuesday.